So I've educated myself, learned a lot from other people, and hopefully I can share some things with you that I've learned along the way. So the disclaimer is I'm not an expert, but I do have a lot of passion. And so all of this stuff I'm going to share is pretty well vetted out. Um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions that you have. And that is it. So that's all my disclaimers. Oh yeah. And I am a um, backyard, or I'm a habitat ambassador for the National Wildlife Federation, which really just means that I've um, taken a, a deep interest in this subject and I've done a lot of things in my yard to help me, I guess, get that certification, provided food, water, shelter, all that kind of stuff but I also help to educate other people. So it's more than just what I've done in my own personal space. It's what I'm trying to also help other people accomplish. So that's where the ambassadorship comes in. So anyway, we will get started with winter backyard birding. And uh, hopefully this is also my first Zoom webinar. So hopefully it all goes well. All right. All right, wait a minute here. Okay. Backyard birding and why would you want to do it in the winter? Most people don't really like going out of their houses in the wintertime. Um, what I'm going to try to do about this is mention several seasons because to be successful with winter birding, there are some things that are very helpful to do in spring, summer, and fall to help you get the most amount of birds in your backyard. So I'll be throwing in some other seasons there too, so it won't be all doom and gloom and snow. All right. So. All right, the benefits of birding, as you can see on the screen, in virtually any given season, pest control birds, um, and I know a lot of, we'll throw bats in there as well. Um, they eat a lot of insects and a lot of insects that you don't want. So bats, I'm sure many of you have heard the statistic is one bat can eat like 100,000 mosquitoes a night. So yay for bats. Um, birds eat a lot of things out of your yard that you don't want either. And on that note, because um, I know I'll forget to say this later, and by the way, my personality is, because you can only remember to write so many things down for each slide. So I go on little side trips sometimes, and hopefully I'll make it back. So, But one very important thing to note here, as far as pest control, but also insects in your yard. If you don't have the right balance in your yard or your area, you are not going to be able to see the birds that you want. For instance, um, no trees, no native bushes, uh, native plants, stuff like that, kind of equals no butterflies. No butterflies equals no caterpillars, you know, because caterpillars turn into butterflies or moths. Birds, feed their babies almost exclusively caterpillars. So you can see that if you haven't provided the right habitat for your birds, then you're not gonna get any. I mean, you have some passersby and things like that. So it's really kind of that whole web of life thing played out just with birds, okay? So a tree and oak trees are really great. I could not rip the statistic off the top of my head but well over a hundred species of butterflies and moths that they'll host, which means that the butterflies uh, and moths will lay their eggs on that oak, on the oak tree, on the leaves, and those all turn into caterpillars, which again, the birds take to feed their babies, okay? So that's just kind of a little thing about that little side trip. So rodent control, weed control, flower pollination, conservation, increased property value, and uh, stress relief. You know, it's, I know an awful lot of people who are pretty stressed out about the times right now. It's always something. It's COVID or, you know, some country getting all hyped up about another country. It's always kind of something. So if you can find something that puts a smile on your face, and I hope some of these pictures will actually, that's a good thing. Okay. So that's just another benefit of birding. Um, you know, when I was I don't know if you can remember this, but probably when you were younger, I know for me when I was younger, there are certain activities that you think just old people do, you know what I mean? And birding, maybe I thought that was one of them, but then the more I travel, the more people I get to know, you know, you get hooked, you get out into nature and you start noticing something, whether it's flowers or 
different kinds of moss or, hey, I've never seen that bird before. And then you get kind of hooked because it's interesting. And it just puts a smile on your face to look out the window and see, hey, there's a bluebird. That makes me happy. So you get kind of hooked into things like that. And you realize it doesn't matter what age that you are. Uh, anybody can appreciate uh, these things, except my sister who hates birds. So ha, hopefully she's not watching this because I just threw her under the bus. All right. Birding is very popular. This little guy in this picture. So um, lots of the pictures I'm happy to say that I'm sharing are from our backyard. Some of them will be stock photos and I'll tell you that. But this little guy, a bluebird, he's an Eastern bluebird. He doesn't normally have that little point on his head. I don't know what was going on with this little bird hair, but I think it's the cutest picture. But how can you not smile at that little guy? So anyway, um, it's a very popular hobby. And I'm sure around the world, not just here. So here are some usual birds that you are able to see. Um, from your backyard, I would say virtually everywhere. So the white-breasted nuthatch, white-breasted nuthatch, is uh, actually in the creeper category. And I'm not going to get too technical with stuff because that bird in the creeper category is about as technical as I can get. But they're sweet little things, and you'll always see them hopping and creeping up the side of a tree. So, or at a suet feeder, or um, actually one of the other feeders that I'll show you in a minute. The goldfinch, a downy woodpecker, which apparently um, is much more prolific in the winter, and obviously a male cardinal. I mean, you can't miss those. So, all right. These are some other familiar birds, and maybe you've seen them and maybe you haven't. Um, in my particular experience, so I live in the suburbs uh, right between Dublin and Worthington. Um, we have a lot of mature trees, but it's still solidly a, you know, a busy suburb. I'm very close to Hard Road and Sawmill Road, but you'll find the more habitat, and I'll get into more of this in just a minute, but the more habitat that you provide for nature, then nature will come and find it, you know, sort of the, if you build it, they will come scenario. So I've rarely seen a tufted titmouse, but I think it's a sweet little thing. And um, they they will come to your feeder, and there you can certainly see them flitting around in trees. Uh, the black cat, black capped chickadees, cedar wax wings. I have only the cedar wax wing. I have only seen in our yard one time, but they are berry lovers. So there are certainly things, and we can talk that. I'll chat about that in just a minute. Um, berry producing bushes. So having the right food, if you had a particular bird that you love, like you always wanted to see a certain kind of bird, then it's quite easy in this age of Google to Google, what does that kind of bird love to eat? And then incorporate that into your yard. So house finches, and of course, uh, I think, I, well, I do have a chipping sparrow here on the bottom right. Chipping sparrows are a little bit more specialized. You can see he has a little, terracotta colored head versus a regular like um I think they're called European sparrows or oh sorry English sparrows those are kind of everywhere they inundate bushes I actually don't think they're native to here but they've made themselves right at home the robins the juncos uh, on the bottom left that junco is a bird that I think you only see in the winter I don't see them in the summer so I'm um, assuming they're a uh, a visitor from up north. The northern flicker, which is in the bottom row uh, to the right, that was in our yard. And I have never seen that bird in our yard before. It was pretty fun. I don't know how well you can see that, but it's in the woodpecker family. So there was a male and a female on our bird feeder, amazingly. And uh, so that was just pretty exciting. I mean, Look again, it made my day. I've never seen one before and I thought it was pretty cool. And I captured that actually with my cell phone. So anyway, just kind of some fun things to check out. So out of towners that I have never had in my yard, these are birds of the Arctic tundra. Okay, so way up in Canada. And 
during what's called an eruption, I-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N, eruption. So basically there's not a lot of food up in Canada. And so they will come down south in large numbers seeking food. So these are times when you may be able to catch these guys at your backyard feeder versus other years or definitely other times of the year. So let me check my notes here. Yep, all right. So those are just, again, some possibilities. I would love to see a couple of these guys, but never have so far. So the 20 most common backyard winter birds in Ohio. In case you are a stats person, here are all the stats on all of the birds that you could possibly see. I gotta say, going through this list, I find it pretty interesting. I do not see, unless I'm going through it too quickly, I do not see the Eastern Bluebird on here. So we have those all over our neighborhood now, and that's good for us to get to see them in the suburbs, but not really so great in the bigger picture because almost certainly what's happened, bluebirds used to be, you would only see them in large expanses of um, like parks or fields and things like that. Well, what's happening with, I'm sure you've noticed, coyotes, foxes, deer, all these kinds of things, there aren't big patches of meadows anymore. And so they keep creeping further into the suburbs. So, I mean, up until a few years ago, I had never seen a bluebird in my yard. I never thought I would see a bluebird in my yard. And now we have several on our bird feeders all the time. So it's pretty fun, but it's just sort of um, a sadder, bigger picture. But anyway, you know, you can go through this list and be like, oh my gosh, I love tufted tit mice. I would love to have attract those to my yard. And then, like I said, just Google and see what, what are the favorite foods of that bird and uh, start incorporating that into your space. Now, look, if you live in an apartment, you are going to be uh, sort of bound to a bird feeder. And certainly it's better than nothing. I mean, you can, you can certainly feed birds off uh, a patio. Off a balcony, I don't know if your underneath neighbors are going to like that because they can get pretty messy. But anyway, these are just some common birds. All right, important to note, the winter changes uh, make many things different, and that includes birds. So if you look at these birds, these are the not technically the exact same bird as in, you know, the exact same bird or a picture of this exact same bird. But these are both male goldfinches. And the picture on the left is what they look like in the wintertime. OK, so I'm sure uh, many of you have seen the guy on the right. That's in his full summer glory. And even my husband, who I make him look at everything that I find interesting, everything that I've taken 52 pictures of in our yard. And he was like, hey, what's that bird out there? He thought it was a brand new bird. Because if you'll notice, it's kind of shocking. Even the bill is a different color. I mean, it's, it's not even an orange bill. So anyway, sometimes they just kind of tone themselves down so they don't stick out from um, you know, a yellow, I'm going to take a leap here. The picture on the right, you can blend in more with yellow flowers and all the bright colors of summer. But if you go looking like that in the winter, a predator bird can be like, oh, well that was easy pickings versus you know, your plumage on the left is uh, far easier to blend into all of the dead grasses and tree stuff, okay? And the, and the female actually is even more dull than that guy. So uh, this is not my picture. It's a really pretty one, but it's another tufted titmouse. But birding in Ohio, as you can read, is only as good as the habitats we provide to wildlife. So the next slides I wanted to share with you, uh, just some ideas, and this could be a whole other webinar series, to be honest with you, but I wanted to share some ideas with you because of, of how you can make your yard a more nature friendly space. Now look, uh, you're gonna look at some of these pictures and be like, I don't have time for all that. I am not proposing that everybody just quit their jobs and radically transform their yards. But what I like to tell friends who ask me for advice about how can I attract more birds, bees, butterflies, whatever, whatever you're into, is start with one corner because that's actually what we did to our yard. 
um, if you can imagine a, a standard suburban lot, we live in a cul-de-sac, so it's a little bit wider, but a typical suburban lot with a few trees and grass. That's it, no, nothing else. But there was one corner that was kind of, not to be melodramatic, but it was kind of speaking to me. It, it was anchored by two trees and I thought, you know what? I'd kind of like to make that look a little more foresty. And, and I do have a picture of uh, what it's become now. Um, but from there, then it just sort of kept creeping and creeping and creeping and getting bigger and bigger and bigger until I've, we've completely transformed the yard. But if you have nowhere for birds to go, they're going to skip right over you. You know, kind of like if uh, you're on the highway and there's an exit and there's, you know, you see some restaurants that have that little sign that says what restaurants are on that exit. And you're like, I don't want any of those. And you keep on going. That's what birds do. And unfortunately, there are less and less and less yards to go to to find anything to eat. So you imagine a, a yard and we've all seen them, a yard with uh, no trees because they don't want to deal with the leaves. So no trees, bushes that aren't native to Ohio and not even a bird feeder, what's a bird supposed to do? Uh, and now if you're a robin, you dig for worms, but if you're not a worm digger, you have nothing else to eat. And if you have several yards of those in a row, it just gets harder and harder for birds to find a place to eat. And I start getting cranky if I pass too many exits where there's nothing to eat. So we don't need cranky birds. So anyway, first slide. So this is the front of our house. This used to be nothing but one big, large, beautiful oak tree, which I greatly valued, but unfortunately it succumbed to a disease that we couldn't do anything about. So now this looks like a heck of a lot of work. Uh, it was putting it in, but now virtually all of that comes up on its own. I am a, a zinnia freak. So I love planting as many zinnias as I have time for. So there's a good load of that in there, but virtually the whole space takes care of itself, relatively speaking. So all of those, I will say most of those flowers provide um, food for lots of different things, but goldfinches, uh, a couple slides ago where you saw that yellow bird and the darker variation in the wintertime, Finches love to get on zinnias and eat the seeds out of it. So um, I try to resist the urge to cut them down too soon because, you know, they start looking ugly because they're dying and they turn brown and it doesn't look pretty anymore. But what doesn't look pretty to us is uh, often quite valuable to a bird because a lot of them love to eat seeds out of that stuff. So just a little side note on there. All right, I guess I didn't hit that. Okay, this is our backyard. So you can start to see a little bit more trees, a little bit different design. But for me, I want a yard that makes me smile when I come home, but creating habitats is pretty and functional. So if you can get your head around that you can have something that's easy to take care of, it's functional and good for nature, it, it, you can do all of it and, and be happy for everybody. So you don't have to knock yourself out. You certainly don't have to do all this to your backyard, but this is sort of like my thing. And I will say over the course of at least 10 years, we've transformed our yard. So this was not a, hey, let's take the summer and transform our yard. Number one, we'd be in copious amounts of debt. And um, yeah, who has time to do all that in one year, especially if you have kids and you work. So Anyway, just some other nature spaces that are possible. Um, this is another area of our yard. But what you can notice in here is uh, there is a water feature. If you can look past the fuchsia um, peonies, which uh, on a side note, those don't do anything for any, in, any insect except for uh, ants. I think they're pretty. My great grandmother used to have them, so they make me smile but I've taken them down to just two bushes because they take up a lot of real estate for a very long period of time during the season. And um, it's not doing any good for any wildlife. So as long as I have a couple stands of them to put a smile on my face, I, I moved on to more native plants. But 
that water feature that I have there, if you can uh, notice that it's bubbling up on the top, uh, robins will get in there and take their little baths. So that's kind of cool. Water features in any form are pretty handy for lots of things. So, but you can see in there, um, and I wish I could figure out how to point. I don't, I'm not going to mess with that because I'll mess something up. But uh, towards the back, you can see that there is a, a form of a cedar, that big bushy yellowy green thing. So that is um, cover and shelter for birds all year round. So I'm a huge proponent of just say you have a blank slate in your yard and you want to start planting things. I would work into your plan, making sure that you have some evergreens, because otherwise in the middle of winter, your yard looks like a dead abyss of nothing. I mean, there's just nothing there except twigs and branches, you know what I mean? Which is not fun. I want to see some greenery and birds really appreciate that too, because if it's, you know, um, Polar vortex, a polar vortex comes through and it gets windy and it's like sleety, rainy, snowy. You know, I would like somewhere to go out of the element. So um, evergreens do that. To the left, and this is not a good picture to show this, but there's a, a frilly purpley black tree thing there. It is a form of an elderberry. And elderberries are fantastic. Uh, because they provide beautiful little flowers in the spring, which turn into little berries. Me personally, I'm on the first five minutes to pluck berries the size of my iris, uh, uh, size of my pupil, and make jam and jelly. I think that's great uh, if I had the time. But who does love those are birds. And I... This was an interesting thing that happened this year. And actually it illustrates the point of bringing nature into your yard is that this year there was a bird disease. I don't know if you heard about it, but I, I never read or heard what the disease actually was, but it was killing songbirds. And they suspected, they being the experts in the field, they suspected that it was being transmitted through um, bird feeders, bird baths, all those communal places, okay? So I took all my bird feeders down, which means now I'm, you know, not being able to look out my window and see birds. But it was interesting. What I did notice is that even more birds were coming to my yard and eating the berries off of the bushes that I have growing specifically to, to feed wildlife. So usually in other years, the only birds that I have noticed, it's not saying that it's the only birds that eat elderberries, but in my yard, the only birds that I've ever seen eat elderberries are the little black cat chickadees. Well, this year I noticed uh, off the top of my head, I'm going to tell you a bunch of birds, but in particular, bluebirds. Now I'm sure there were sparrows in there because sparrows are everywhere and in my bluebird houses. Um, but the native plants, native, and, and so I like to address things as if no one knew anything about what I was talking about, because I don't, I want, I don't want anyone to feel like stupid, you know, so me not talk right over someone's head if you're new to all of this birding stuff or uh, native plants and native, all that kind of stuff. Native means that it has always lived in Ohio. It's genetically um, what do you say, genetically hardwired to understand the elements of the seasons and the soil types and the precipitation of Ohio. So plants are native to Ohio or they're native to California or they're native to Spain or Asia. We have a lot of Asian species of things that are over here. They might be pretty. Lots of them, it's okay if they're in your yard, but typically things like that don't be the native wildlife that has, has always been in Ohio. Hopefully that makes sense. So anyway, having the native bushes fed the birds in a natural way, and I still got to observe them. So it was just really cool. Uh, and look, uh, doesn't cost you any money. You, you plant a tree, which would cost you money, but it's less load on your wallet versus feeding them via bird food, if that makes sense. So on to the next one. Okay, this is our backyard. And you can see 
to the right is a tall stand of trees. And I'm really lucky because my neighbor, who has a beautiful backyard herself, has a whole row of some kind of evergreen, some kind of pine, which provides a beautiful backdrop to what I'm trying to do, creates a forest-like feel in my backyard, but it's a great place for birds to go in and out of, protects them from the elements and all that kind of jazz. So in this picture, hopefully you can detect, there's a couple of bird baths in there. And if you're going to do a bird bath, it's best if you try to keep it clean. You know, let's say every week or so, you wash it out, soap and water, dry it out, and then put some clean water back in there. Uh, I have a natural water source and you can't see that uh, it's amongst all the greenery there on the right. It's actually a um, rubber made cattle trough. So there's all kinds of things that you can get to make a uh, pond out of. Evergreens, deciduous trees, which means uh, trees that drop their leaves every year, shrubs and bird feeders. So, you know, look, if you have a very small yard or a very small budget or a very small amount of time. A tree, a shrub, a bird feeder and a bird bath. And you've, you've got yourself a little habitat going, so you don't have to just go all out. You can start very small and nature will find you. It's actually kind of amazing. I have a lot of thoughts about that, but that's a different webinar. So this is um, the side of our house, the north side of our house. And this used to be absolutely nothing but grass. I mean, 100% grass. So uh, it's impossible for, impossible for me to point all this out, but there are elderberries, um, all kinds of native bushes, a few things that aren't native, but they aren't um, invasive. And when you hear the term invasive, an invasive species, it means a species that comes in here and does some damage and wipes out what originally lived here, whether that's a um, plant or an animal. They, they dominate and overtake, and then the little guy loses out. So invasive is bad. Exotic is not always bad. Non-native is not always bad. My peonies are don't believe are native, but that may not be entirely accurate. Or, or an Asiatic lily, you know, the fancy schmancy lilies we get. They're not gonna do any harm, but they're not doing any good. It's not feeding anybody, they just look pretty, that's it. But they're not overtaking anything else. So that's a, a little spiel about what a term like that means. So overwhelmingly in our yard, we have mostly native. And even this walkway actually, they are river rock, like, um, you know, walking things, you can, rocks you can walk on, like flagst flagstones, whatever they're called. Anyway, and in between there, technically we had creeping thyme in there, uh, but that's a source of food uh, for, for you and other things. It gets little flowers on them and all that kind of stuff. But um, this is a well-worn path and creeping thyme doesn't like that as a side note. So anyway, it. The more nature friendly that you get, the more things you're gonna start seeing come in. So like I said, you plant things for butterflies, you'll automatically get more birds because as I mentioned before, uh, butterflies will lay their eggs on host plants and uh, caterpillars will emerge and then the birds come in for the feeding frenzy. So anyway, it always usually ties together. I love ponds, like I love the sound of them. Um, this was something I did uh, during quarantine, I believe. And this was literally a weekend project. This is right outside our front door. Uh, this is relevant, all of this is relevant to winter birding. Uh, but, you know, there's a, a, a little short amount to talk about literal winter birding. But like I said before, a little bit of before and after to, to ensure that your winter birding goes better for you. So this pond, um, you can put a pond heater in there. Uh, they come in all shapes, sizes, and costs. And um, that would, would be another spot for birds to be able to get a drink. Because sometimes your yard might be the only place that has fresh water for a lot of places, like for a, a few blocks. I mean, even the water that congregates, you know, usually on those little, on the side of the street, if it's really cold out, those are all frozen. 
and most people don't have bird baths. So if you can provide at least one spot for drinkable water um, to be available to birds, that would be great. The thing that I thought of, and I don't have it for uh, this pond, I actually let this pond freeze over. This is about two and a half feet deep, but there is fencing that is uh, green metal fencing and it has you know spaces in it about this big. So I could put that, if you can envision this, I could put that over the water, but under the rocks there to keep it in place. And birds would be able to perch on there and then get a drink out of there if I had a pond heater in there. Okay. So that would be a great spot. I, I have other bird baths and uh, bird waterers for them to drink from. So I don't have to worry about this one. But if you just had one spot and you wanted one pond and you don't want five places to worry about, uh, you could certainly do something like that. But I have had things drown in other ponds. Um, not not very many birds, but I've had a few. So I'm going to be doing that screen thing in my other ponds as well. Oh, uh, an important to note, I know it's written down, but uh, don't use any chemicals in this in the ponds. Look, if you're if you're going to have a pond, uh, all kinds of wildlife will come and find it. And again, that's a different webinar too, because I've had um all kinds of dragonflies come to my ponds, toads, frogs. It's been super fun. Uh, but all of those animals are very susceptible to chemicals. And I think as a society, we've been conditioned to think that we pour chemicals on everything. Our lawn, you, do, you don't want weeds and you go squirt roundup or whatever equivalent all over everything. And wildlife cannot handle that stuff. It, it kills them. So. Um, especially the pesticides, this is actually a very important time to mention. Pesticides can indiscriminately kill. And I, I know that most people think they're, it's, it's okay, you know, you're spraying your entire lawn to keep the weeds out. And I do understand that, uh, especially if you start out with a mess of a lawn. We were fortunate that when we moved into this house, the previous owners had treated the heck out of it. Okay. So they had thrown all kinds of chemicals all over the lawn. So we started out with a nice lawn. Okay. So I didn't have to maintain, I should say, all I have to do is maintain it. We hand dig dandelions, but I didn't have 10,000 dandelions to get out in the first place. I could totally understand if somebody had to do a couple of rounds of something really yucky all over their lawn, and then you don't do it anymore because unfortunately that will kill every insect in your lawn as well. Maybe not every, but you get the point that I'm making. And people complain. They're like, oh, when I was a kid, I used to see fireflies all the time, and I just don't see those anymore. Well, you don't see them anymore because people put pesticides and herbicides all over their lawns, and it kills them. So you can very quickly understand how then birds don't have anything to eat. Okay, so there are so many companies, and you really have to kind of get nitty gritty with what exactly they're using when they tell you they're an organic um, pest control company, uh, whether you're talking about uh, pest pests like insects or rats or whatever, or your lawn care company um, to make sure that you're really not going to be putting anything down on your lawn that would harm what you're trying to attract. So anyway, just a, a little thing about that. The, the least amount of chemicals that you can possibly use in your yard everyone's better off for it. So especially when we're talking about trying to bring more nature, specifically birds into your yard. Trees, sort of already mentioned that sort of thing. Um, there are some great economical benefits to having trees, great windbreaks, or if you're living in the middle of a field, you want a windbreak and you need a sun screen for your house, or you're gonna be paying a lot of money in um, heating and cooling bills. Visually, I think I mentioned this in a previous slide, uh, I do not have the statistics in front of me, but for a fact, trees raise property value. So look, you can do a good thing and make money at it as well. Native and fruit bearing trees, uh, viburnums and high bush cranberries are really great. Um, I call them a very non-technical term, uh, bushy tree things because they're way bigger than a bush, but they're not really a tree. They kind of cap off at 15 feet tall and they don't just have a single, uh, what do you call it, single trunk. 
they just sort of go up all together. But they have beautiful little flowers on them and they have um, berries that are produced that if you were a forager, you could eat them if you have about 25 pounds of sugar you want to add to the berries. But what I've noticed is when things get lean and cold and yucky outside, then the birds will eat those. They won't touch them until they're out of all other options. But that is a great resource for birds. And they are both native to Ohio. Uh, Franklin County Soil and Water has a tree and native plant sale every year. It is a fantastic resource. We got several of these viburnums and high bush cranberries and all kinds of other things. You get like, look, I'm kind of making this up, but it's close enough to the point. Five little sticks for like $10. And so you can go out and spend more. At, 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 sorry about that. I thought I'd turn that off. At any of the various nurseries around town that um, specialize in native plants, bushes, trees, flowers, all that kind of stuff, you can certainly just go buy one. You know what I mean? It's already six feet tall or four feet tall or whatever. But throughout the years, uh, raising my daughter and she was in uh, national club sports. So that gets kind of pricey. I just decided patience was the way to go. And I got the five little sticks for 10 bucks and they very quickly grew, turn into beautiful bushes that help anchor and define our yard, which um, the picture that you're looking at, the grass actually is my neighbor's property. And all of that foliage, you see trees, flowers, and all that define my yard and give me Instead of just a fence, it, it gives me a natural fence and a natural barrier to give me some privacy. Even look, even if my neighbor was my absolute best friend, I still like my space. You know what I mean? I feel like we all just like our space. All right, just another just another angle. Um, I think I already talked about goldfinches love um, the seeds and cities. This aster that is the frilly little lavender thing there on the bottom that has uh, seeds in it too. That tree that, that looks like the, the main weepy tree, it's a form of a red bud. It's a vanilla twist red bud. And on a little quick note about that, that is a hybrid, okay? A native red bud is just called a red bud. If it has a first name, I don't know what it is, but it's just a red bud. Vanilla twist red bud or fancy pants red bud, I made that up. Uh, those are called hybrids. I recently learned this. You have to be very careful with hybrids. The guy at Oakland Nursery assured me this was like a native hybrid. Okay. So it still retained the properties that native wildlife will utilize. I do believe that this vanilla twist red bud gets a little seed in the leaf somewhere, which would be of value to native birds, because birds eat seeds, okay? If you were getting any other fancy kind of bush, tree, flower, usually, but not always, usually they are sterile, which means if you think you're going to the nursery and you're buying a flower, because you're doing a good thing, you want a pretty flower that feeds butterflies, or you want a cool tree, that flowers and feeds birds or whatever the issue is, I'd be very careful where you get it um, because it may be sterile and not produce nectar, seeds, or, or uh, pollen, okay? So that's very important to know. Um, Oakland Nursery is actually doing a pretty good job. I don't think they do this on all things, but I've noticed on their um, little tags, it says in so many words, it's sterile. It is of no use to wildlife. So if you just want to go buy a pretty flower or a cool tree, because that's all you're looking to do, that's a different story. But if you want to make sure that it's doing what you want it to do, attract birds, feed butterflies and other wildlife, you're best just to stick with Scioto Gardens, Oakland Nursery, uh, quite a few other groovy plants ranch, uh, some other local nurseries and ask someone, will this produce pollen or nectar or seeds 
because I want to attract birds, bees, or butterflies. So hopefully that that makes sense. Okay, plan for a bird bonanza. Food, water, food, water, shelter, a place to raise your young and sustainable practices. If you wanted to get super fancy and have your yard certified as a backyard wildlife habitat, those are the things you need to prove to the National Wildlife Federation that you're doing. If you don't care about uh, little certificates or yard signs, which I do, <laughs> uh, this would be though, for real, what you would need to do to ensure that you get the greatest amount of birds to your yard, whether it's spring, summer, winter, or fall, okay? Food, a steady supply, probably a varied supply of uh, seeds and native fruit bearing bushes or trees. Water, like I said, it's very important, especially during the winter so that they have a fresh supply of drinkable water. Shelter, as I mentioned, um, trees, uh, evergreens, stuff like that are really great for them to hang out in, especially when it gets really cold, uh, nesting boxes and all that. A place to raise their young, which would they would need trees or a nesting box to do that. Nobody's going to lay a nest on the ground. And sustainable practices. Um, Sustainable, really what they're talking about in case you've been ever confused about that term, this is not a technical term. Sustainable means you can keep it going, okay? So a native tree, a native uh, flower, a native bush, it's easy to keep it going. If you get something fancy that originates from another country or something that's only used to growing in the hottest part of Arizona, you are going to have a very difficult time getting it to stay growing here. You're, it may not be a sustainable um, plant for you to maintain uh, because you're going to have to baby the heck out of it, water it and do all the, the stuff versus things that are used to being in Ohio. It's just so much easier to grow if, if that makes sense. No pesticides, keeping your cat indoors. Uh, my cats go out with me and with me only. Uh, that does not mean that I have my eye on them every second of the day. But apparently the statistic is cats that wander around, and I am, I'm a person who is adamantly opposed to letting cats wander off your property and just wander the neighborhood. A domesticated cat is domesticated to be with a human. And, uh, you know, the, the temperatures that are out right now uh, are very dangerous for these animals because uh, it's, no, not so easy to catch food all the time and nobody likes to be cold. But all of these cats apparently kill billions with a B. That's hard to imagine, but it's a lot of birds every year. So if you're kind of into birds, keeping your cats indoors or um, finding a shelter for a stray to go to, it was re is really the best bet. Okay, a place to call home. Both of these pictures are from my yard. That is a nesting pair of bluebirds, very exciting stuff. We got this uh, bluebird house from Wild Birds Unlimited. I got the, the house and the pole from there. If you notice on the right, you can see fishing twine on either side of that hole of the bluebird box. On a side note, the reason that is there is these English sparrows will come from far and wide to a mind numbing degree and super annoying to kill out the bluebirds in the bluebird box. And then what you get are no bluebirds and a whole new generation of sparrows. So not, not fun if you wanted to attract bluebirds. So it's quite interesting, most of the time, if you get it right, and usually on either side of the hole really does the trick. The, the sparrow tries to fly into the hole and they're, they just can't figure it out and they leave. And the bluebird literally folds its wings and just whoosh, right into the hole. So it worked pretty well, um, but now is also the time to be cleaning out any bird box that you have uh, on your property, or if you're buying a new one, then you're, you just start fresh. It's really pretty early in the year. And again, I am not an expert on when birds go house hunting, but I think you really should have them out in February. 
But if you get a nice day that you don't mind being a little bit chilly, the sooner you can get them out, the less of a chance you're going to forget. And then, oops, it's May and they've already sought housing somewhere else. So the sooner the better and make sure it's clean because they can pass diseases and all that kind of stuff. All right, bird food. So, like I said, um, certain birds really have uh, favorites. Uh, cardinals love sunflower seeds. Uh, keep it coming. So don't, you know, don't go whole hog one week and then don't feed them again for two weeks. I mean, look, they'll go somewhere else. But if you, if you want the best bird viewing experience and um, nobody likes to find a favorite restaurant only to find out that it closed down, you know what I mean? So you can keep a steady supply, keep it clean, keep it coming. Then you'll have more birds. Okay. These are some bird food choices and you can see a whole list of them there. You can go to any store and get a mix. I recently learned in doing this PowerPoint presentation that a lot of times those, I wouldn't call it a good mixed seed, I would call it a cheap mixed seed. Apparently there is a lot of filler. I'm going to assume that the little round things might be called millet. I think some of the stuff in there that looks like that just gets chucked on the ground and then that's a problem for rodents, which I will unfortunately get to in a minute. So it's wasting your money is the point. So spending the money on a good mixed seed is probably your best bet, but you can see these other things. And like I said, yeah, if you want a wide variety of birds, get a good mixed seed. If you're like, hey, I'm a cardinal freak, then make sure you have a good supply of the back black oil sunflower seeds. Blue birds love mealworms, but that should not be, first of all, you'll go broke. They're kind of expensive, relatively speaking, just to feed birds just that, but it's a great treat to add into the rest of it. My favorite thing, I mean, you can see all the stuff that's up there and you have, a, you have access to this later, but as a bonus, my personal favorite, and I cannot believe, I, can, I honestly don't even know why I bought this, chip sunflower seeds. The, the shell is gone. It's just the inside of the sunflower seed all chipped up, okay? I mean, I can't even believe how many. That's when the bluebirds started coming to our feeder. That's the flickers. That northern flicker came. Downy woodpeckers. Uh, I get this mixed up. Red-bellied woodpeckers. I mean, everything. It, it's been amazing. So my two main feeders, and I don't put out a billion feeders. I don't eat swarms of birds. Uh, plus, that's just too many things to maintain because you don't want to drive yourself crazy that you got to get up in the morning and feed 20 feeders or, or fill 20 feeders. But this chip sunflower is amazing. I would suspect you can get it at... Wild Birds Unlimited, but I'm not sure. We go to Champion Feed and Supply in Delaware. I I get the roads mixed up. Um, 36, 37, or 42, whatever. Whatever's the opposite direction of downtown Delaware, that's the road it's on, but it's called Champion Feed and Supply. It's a co-op. Um, anyway, it, it's it's a fantastic feed. Every bird in our yard loves it. So you can see there on the left, I mean, I was downstairs cleaning out our basement one day, and this was like a year or two ago, came upstairs, looked out the kitchen window, and that's what I saw. I mean, I almost had a stroke. There were just so many bluebirds, and at one point there were eight. So they just love it. And then you see on the right where that cardinal is, is he's like, I don't, I don't want those chip sunflower middles. I want, I want the whole thing. So Anyway, uh, just some examples, and those are both in our backyard, like I said. Just an example of kind of feeding them what they want. All right, now you got some food, you got some ideas, now what? So placing your food in water where you can get the most enjoyment is a great idea. I don't have any bird feeders on the sides of my house where I don't have windows, because why would I do that? That's just more work for me. And I don't even get anything out of it because I can't even see what's going to feed off the feeders. So finding a spot where you can enjoy seeing who's coming to your feeder is always a good idea. Um, now is a good time. Like I mentioned, if you're like, hey, I've not done any of that. I don't, I really want to just get started. 
now is a great time. I mean, just peek out your windows and see where you have a spot. I'm not even proposing you radically transform your whole yard, but just think, where's a spot where maybe I could put a bird feeder, put a bird bath, uh, and if you want to maintain that bird bath in the winter, where is a spot that you could logically get to an outlet? Okay, so that's going to have to, that's a thing. Um, and uh, if you're really, really feeling uh, like a go-getter, where could I add a tree, a, a bush or something like that that I don't have now? Okay, uh, clean your windows. I have a bird feeder outside of our kitchen window. It used to be closer. And so every, I don't even know what they did. Bird spit, uh, chips of sunflower seeds, a rain, everything hit the window and it made it dirty. So I had to clean it all the time. But I can't take any pictures if I can't get past all the spots on my window from inside, from the kitchen, you know, from the sink and on the other side. But even if you're not going to take any pictures, it's it's nice to look out a clean window so you get a good view. And then some gear. Uh, look, if you really don't care about what the bird is and you don't want pictures and it's at a good distance that you can see it, you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, I'm quite curious by nature, so it gets to the point that I want to know what that bird is. So a, uh, there's all kinds, hopefully you can see this, I'll put it in front of my face. Um, just a good bird book. Uh, Birds of Ohio, then you don't have to sift through who cares what's in California because you're not going to see it. Um, but any kind of a, a bird identification book is very helpful. So you kind of get to know what's outside your window. Uh, camera. Look, if, if it's close enough, any kind of camera is going to do it. I have an iPhone 13 that is, I'm not going to lie, if you're due for an upgrade, it's amazing. It takes amazing pictures, um, but any kind of point and shooter, if you have a long lens, anything like that, that'll do it. Uh, binoculars, I am not a binocular expert. I did do just a, quite a bit of research on getting a new pair of binoculars. I could not rip that off the top of my head to help you out on that. A Google search, best binoculars for birding, that'll do it. So you can make a good choice because you don't want to spend any amount of money and then still not be able to see the bird across your yard. Okay. So hopefully uh, you can find a good pair that will get you what you want. All right, bird feeder raiders. The left-hand picture is a squirrel. That is my picture. Uh, yeah, hanging that feeder from a bush was a bad idea because you can see what happened every single day. And that's cute, but I am not a squirrel fan. Uh, they do a lot of damage in my yard and destroyed that bird feeder because if they can't just reach right in there and get it then they start digging and gnawing for it so then they just destroyed the feeder the, uh, that did not make me happy so there is nothing hanging from a tree anymore nothing hanging from something that the squirrel or worse can climb up to get to the feeder the right hand side those are rats those are brown norway rats um, Thank God that is not my picture. I do have a rat problem um, because my whole neighborhood has a, has a rat problem and that is probably a whole other webinar. They did construction near our house, displaced the rats out of the um, sewer system and now we're never getting rid of them. It's been pretty fun. But one of the things that you need to consider especially where it pertains to the rat situation, you're not gonna see rats out during the day. They will come out at night. So any feed that came out of the feeder and went all over the ground is going to be food for rats. So screens, and I just realized I do not have a picture of this. They make screens to hang off of a feeder like that, like the feeder those rats are on. Uh, they make a round screen that goes under it with hooks that hook into either the ring at the top or into that mesh. Okay, so that will catch most of the seed that would fall to the ground. And that's a very good way to prevent rats from gathering where anywhere that you don't want them to be, which is anywhere. So you're gonna have to outsmart them. Uh, squirrels are ridiculously smart when it comes to trying to figure out how to get their bird seed. So you see on the left, the far left there, it just they just 
do acrobatic maneuvers, to hang off stuff, climb up things. Um, one thing that I did read, because uh, some people say, well, just put um, petroleum jelly on the pole. That is bad. Now, all of a sudden, I can't remember why it's bad, but it's not good for the animals to like lick it off their paws or other thing gets stuck in it. Point is, don't do that. It's not good for lots of things. These baffles that you see in the picture two and three, um, those are handy. Sadly, they are not cheap. Uh, it's, you know, I'm sure you can get on Google, YouTube, all kinds of things and find very cheap ways, cheap and effective ways to keep squirrels off of your bird feeders. Um, because the baffles all seem to be over 20 bucks, which if you're on a tight budget, that's, you know what I mean? Not everybody has that all the time. Uh, I have not done this yet, but a couple of suggestions were just make a separate squirrel restaurant and call it a day. Somewhere far off on the side of your yard, unless you love to see squirrels, and I know lots of people do, love to see squirrels feeding. I personally am good. I would probably put that corn feeder practically in my neighbor's yard, but get it away from my bird feeders because, you know, the bird seed wasn't cheap in the first place. And again, I'm not trying to feed squirrels. So uh, if they if they eat the stuff off the ground, that's fine with me, but uh, I don't want them hanging off of my bird feeders. All right. So we talked about, I talked about um, the bird eruptions from Canada. Some of the other cool things, if you want to venture out of your backyard, you can actually go to some state parks. In these eruption years, you can actually see a snowy owl. I went to uh, Alum Creek last year, the year before, whatever. There was a big, I don't know, snowy owl eruption. But they came down from the Arctic tundra of Canada and made their way all the way to Ohio. And this guy, now that picture is actually taken. I forgot my camera, if you can even believe that. Well, I forgot to change the battery in my camera. That is with my cell phone through binoculars, so it could be worse. Um, that was at Allen Creek Dam, but these snowy owls came all the way down to Ohio. So apparently there's lots of things you can see throughout the state that come down from Canada that are, are not normally here. Uh, the snowy owl, a golden eagle, which again was something I learned in researching this presentation. I had no idea that was possible. And apparently you can see them at the wilds, like not captive, but they come to that area. So that would be really pretty cool. A Northern Harrier, um, which is a, a hawk falcon kind of thing, and three additional species of owls. So that's kind of cool. But look, unless you live adjacent to Alum Creek State Park or adjacent to some crazy wide open field, you're more than likely not going to see these guys in your backyard. So, you know, just look up all the various state parks around Ohio and see what maybe you can find out. So that is it for the presentation. I'm, uh, thanks again for having me. Um, I also have a website called Backyard Columbus and where I try to showcase things in my backyard what other people are doing so that we can all kind of bring nature home, which is actually bringing nature home is a book by Doug Tallamy, who is a great big fat hairy deal in the world of planting native and bringing nature into your backyard because we're losing so much of nature in other places. So anyway, uh, again, thank you for having me. And then I'll let Jessica do whatever she does. <laughs> Very good job, Kathy. And those pictures were amazing. We could have made this just about the pictures. So very good job. Um, I have here some questions and some comments from folks. Um, so somebody asks, are your wildlife be, you know, all your pictures posted anywhere online like Flickr or IG? Yes, I do have uh, Instagram and Facebook. I don't have a Flickr account, but Instagram and Facebook, it's Backyard Columbus. All right, I'm going to go ahead and type that in. Is it hashmark Backyard Columbus? Yeah, hashtag Backyard Columbus. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to put that in the messages. And that's for Instagram? Yep, Instagram. Yep, Instagram and Facebook. Um, 
and my Instagram feeds into my Facebook page. But if you're a person who's only on Facebook, then you can type in Backyard Columbus uh, as a fan page and uh, I'll pop up. Okay, thank you. And I did put the link, or at least I put the the URL for your Backyard Columbus in the chat. Thank you. Have, let's see. Somebody asks, I believe you answered this, but are all of your plants native or do you try to? Uh, it's overwhelmingly native, but not all of them. I do not have any invasive plants. And so I chatted about that for a second, but here's a very good example. Um, I had some, oh shoot, babe, uh, barberry, barberry bushes. You know, um, if you can imagine, it's those bushes that practically every business has, every parade of homes has, they're those little purpley, dark purpley bushes and um, they have thorns in them. I had several varieties, they were very pretty. They get little flowers on them, then they get little berries on them, which I actually didn't realize they are invasive. And what happens is birds eat the berries, they go poop them out in, forest, in the forest, and then they'll overtake the area. So I pulled all of those out. So in like I hopefully explained well, uh, non-native is not always invasive. Non-native can be okay. You know, like I said, the Asiatic lily, you just have a, a favorite kind of like those orange lilies that aren't native to here. Uh, those aren't gonna do any damage versus a barberry that will overtake an area and, and can spread outside of your yard. So that's what you want to avoid is anything that's invasive. And uh, I will tell you, probably Ohio State, uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, uh, you could look up invasive plants of Ohio and it will give you a list of what you should not have in your yard. All right. Thank you. Another question. Somebody asks, do you ask the city to skip spraying for your home for mosquitoes when they do outside spraying? A hundred percent every single time. <laughs> yes. So here's the bummer. Like on either side of my yard, if they both don't do that and it's a windy day, I'm going to get it anyway, but at least I don't get a direct hit. Yeah. So that's like, you know, that's the best that you can do because that is one of the downfalls of living in a community. You know what I mean? They do take community measures that you may not agree with. And so at least they give me that option of taking me off the list. Yeah, I do have a comment from Darlene. She says she's the president of the Ohio Bluebird Society and they put their, um, she says we put it out by the end of February and that they have a lot of good info on their website. So that's the Ohio Bluebird Society. Oh, awesome. All right. Um, let's see, I have some more questions on the bottom. It says, how many hours do you spend on maintaining your yard? So less than you, this is a very non-technical answer, less than you would think, but I also, I've become like a tinkerer. Even when there's things that I don't have to do, I go out and find stuff to do, which usually entails taking pictures of insects. But um, I also have backyard chickens and I have um, 11, 16 square foot garden beds where I raise vegetables and stuff like that. But as far as if you talk about stereotypical things like weeding and things like that, like per week, I doubt I even spend an hour because uh, once you get your yard or your area, let's just take a corner so I don't overwhelm anybody uh, by thinking this is like way too much to take care of. Because I mean, look, we all have time limitations or physical limitations or things like that. Even if you just had a corner, once you get that area built up to a spot, and I mean built up, meaning, say, for budgetary reasons, you buy little baby plants and they're really small. And so there's all this space between them. Weeds can get in there and then you have more to maintain. That's where a good deep layer of mulch comes in handy. But as those plants grow, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they're touching each other. Then you hardly have any weeds at all. In the areas of my yard where that has happened, I don't even mulch under there because it's A, it's a waste of my money and a waste of my time because A, I don't see it, and B, hardly any weeds go in there because the weed seeds from the air 
can't bypass the leaves that are touching each other. So once you get it built up, or if you have money, you buy bigger bushes and that they're already touching. So hopefully um, that makes sense. Okay. Yes, it does. And I have a comment um, from someone that says, I don't have conifers, but all my neighbors do. And that's where the birds hide. She is the restaurant and the watering hole thanks to the pond. So Oh, that's, that's nice. Awesome. <laughs> you can thank yeah. your neighbors for some of your some of your birds too. Yes. All right. And that is all of the questions and comments that I have from our viewers today. Well, Kathy, thank you once again. Um, heck, I want to have you back for how to how to photograph these things. These are amazing pictures. Very good job. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I really had fun. Yeah, and you pulled it together very quickly and nicely. So thank you for that. I appreciate <laughs> it. You're all welcome. All right. <laughs> For everybody on, the next program is on February 3rd. The registration is not yet up, but go ahead and keep an eye on that for the next week on our website. And that one is Turn Your Yard into a Homegrown National Park. Okay, everybody. Well, once again, thank you. All participants will be receiving a link to the video and the chat transcript. And uh, once again, check out Kathy's webpage and your Instagram and Facebook for more great pictures and information. All right. Thank you, everybody. You have a good day. Awesome. Kathy, thank you. I'll send you the original video, okay? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.